Kind of takes your breath just for a moment. Praise the Lord. Praise God. Stretch your hands out towards our dear brother here. Now, Father, I want to thank you for this young man. Now, Lord, I want to thank you, Father God, that he's made a public, Lord, display of his faith. Lord, he's made a declare, Lord, that he is going to serve you and he's going to honor you. And, Lord, I'm asking you right now, God, Lord, to honor that. And I pray, God, that you would just set him apart. Lord, separate him unto you. I pray, Lord, that he would do extraordinary feats. Lord, that bring much glory and honor to your holy name. Lord, I declare, Lord, that he has an anointing, Lord, to excel academically. Lord, that he's going to receive scholarships. Lord, that he's going to go farther than any member of his family's ever gone. And so I bless him today in the mighty name of Jesus. Now, according to your profession of faith, I baptize you in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. And now we have Ralph Bentley. He's come to follow the Lord tonight. Praise the Lord. They will never, ever forget this moment. Praise the Lord. Amen. Stretch your hands out towards Brother Ralph. Father, I want to thank you for this man of God. And I want to thank you that he's a man of influence. He's a man of honesty, integrity, and purity. Lord, I just want to thank you, Lord God. Lord, that your hand is upon him in a mighty way. Lord, I pray you would use him, Lord. Lord, gloriously in the days of head to be a great, Lord, witness for you in Jesus' mighty name. Now, Ralph, according to your profession of faith, I baptize you tonight in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Give the Lord another good hand for all these that are baptized tonight. Praise the Lord. Amen. I don't know what happened. Normally, the baptistry is warm and toasty and everything's nice, but I guess someone wanted to be a more memorable experience tonight. <laughs> so praise the Lord. So good to see you in the house of the Lord tonight. And we'd like to take a moment and welcome those that are guests this evening. If this is your first time to be with us, we are so glad that you've come to worship with us here at Evangel. And our ushers have a gift that we'd like to present to you, and they're coming now. And if you'll just lift your hand real high, they'll be happy to provide that for you. It's good to see some longtime friends from way back here. Amen. <laughs> Praise the Lord. So many wonderful guests. Uh, you know what, let's give them another good hand. We've got some folks right up here, ushers, right up here in the front. Amen. Well, we're so glad that you've come. I am going to ask if you would take a moment, open that bag, and look inside, and you'll find a guest brochure. And there will be a guest card inside that brochure or close to it. If you would take a moment and fill that out tonight before you go. Drop that in the offering whenever it's received. That way we'll have record of your attendance, and we appreciate you taking the time to do that. And again, come back as often as you possibly can, which, by the way, as you're going to hear on our video announcements, you'll have an opportunity to come back tomorrow night. And so you'll find out more about that in just a moment. There's a couple of things that I'd like to mention that are not in the video announcements. One is that we have a WE gathering. That's our women's ministry. That's going to be happening on Saturday at 10 a.m. at the Miners Lane campus with Pastor Margaret Rogers. And so we invite you to come out. It's a discussion time, sharing, and ministry, and it's ladies. It's open to all who would like to come and be a part of that. And then one week from tonight, we're going to have with us uh, missionary Bill McDonald. Uh, Bill is out of our church, got saved here in our church, married his wife here in our church, and uh, God sent them to Ecuador over 20 years ago and used them in a marvelous way to reach that nation. And, and actually, all the Spanish-speaking people of the world now are under the umbrella of their satellite ministry. And so we encourage you to come out next Sunday night, one service only. Amen. If you would turn your attention to the screens for ENN, and the ushers will be coming with tithe and offering envelopes while we look at these announcements. Hello, 
I'm Monica Freeman. I do the Women of Excellence Ministry here at Evangel World Prayer Center. I have so many announcements for you today. Many, many, many. Just kidding. There's only a few, but you need to count them to see how many you can count. Do you know you can see Jesus in every book of the Bible? Is that awesome? So He appears in Genesis. He appears in every book, and as you behold Him, you are changed and transformed into His image. I'm going to be in Louisville, Kentucky at Evangel World Prayer Center, April 7th and 8th. We are going to see Jesus in every book of the Bible. You cannot miss it. Bring friends with you, and they will be transformed in you also. Evangel Men's Ministry present the Thunder Before Thunder. Men's shooting event Saturday, April 20th, 9 a.m. at Knob Creek Gun Range. Open to all men and kids with a parent. Food, fun, and fantastic prizes. $10 range free. Bring your own gun or rent one for $10 an hour plus ammo. Evangel Women's Ministry is having a women's breakfast April 27th at 8 a.m. inside the Miners Lane campus. This event is free and open to all women. Pastor Benny Hinn is coming back to Louisville, Kentucky for a two-day miracle crusade at the Evangel World Prayer Conference Center, April 17th and 18th at 7 p.m. nightly. All seats are free and doors will open one hour before the service. Join Pastors Bob and Margaret Rogers and the Jewish Federation of Louisville for a special night to honor Israel. April 21st at 5 p.m. at the Evangel World Prayer Conference Center, 6900 Billtown Road. With special keynote speaker David Brog, Executive Director of Christians United for Israel. Join in this time of celebration at the annual Night to Honor Israel, April 21st at 5 p.m. Watch us live online each Sunday. And for special events and conferences, visit worldprayercenter.org and click on Streaming. This is Monica Freeman for Evangel News Network. This is the first opportunity to uh, be in a service with Sister Marilyn Hickey. May I see your hand? Uh, there's a number here. Well, you're in for a great, great treat. This is going to be a great night. Amen. Praise the Lord. Uh, come up here just a moment. I want you all to, where, come on up here, Donna. You all just uh, introduce yourself. Turn around here. I'm Donna Oberkorn. Uh, Darren Oberkorn. Turn around this way. And um, just, uh, it's been one, a couple of weeks, two weeks. Uh, share what, share what had. Um, I had surgery for breast cancer. And this was very serious cancer. And uh, God has touched her. Now there's no trace of any cancer. And she's here in church tonight. And I think this is just wonderful. Thank you. If you are here and you have cancer or you have a member of your family who has cancer, I want you to stand up right now. Would you please stand? And uh, I want you to uh, stretch your hands out to one of these that are standing. Father, I want to thank you for what you've done for Donna. Lord, this is a, a great miracle. And Lord, you see these that are standing representing family members that have cancer. We curse. We curse these demons. We curse this affliction. And Father, by the grace and by the power of the Holy Spirit, I break cancer off of every person here in Jesus' name. Now, Donna, may you be cancer-free all of your life. May your children be cancer-free. May your great-grandchildren be cancer-free. May God bless you with strength in Jesus' name for the glory of God. And everyone said, Amen. Amen. Let's give the Lord a great big praise for us. God bless you. So that God's done for you. Amen. I had a lady come to me uh, today, and a very humble lady in our church, and her daughter... Uh, had uh, gone through a divorce, uh, having difficult times, had moved in with her. Uh, she had been divorced herself. And uh, this, she planted a $1,000 seed. Say a $1,000 seed. $1,000 seed. She planted a $1,000 seed. And uh, right after that, she felt very 
impressed to look up her, her husband that she had been divorced from for ages. She didn't know where she could find him. She finally got a hold of his phone number and she called him. And he was so delighted that she had called. In fact, as he said, you know, I, I lost all track of where you were and, and our daughter. When she, uh, when she had gotten married, he didn't know her uh, married name. He said, I've been trying really to find you. I have, uh, they've, they've found cancer in my body. I don't have very long to live. And I want to give everything I've got, I want to give it to our daughter. And, and left her a half a million dollars. Now, you plant big, you get. You plant little, you get. And so I want to, I, I think probably the greatest day in her life was when she planted that $1,000 gift. And I want to say to everyone that's, uh, viewing today, listening today, here in this service. If you feel like God speaks to you to give big, you give big. And God will answer big. Can I hear an amen? amen? And sometimes if you're expecting a huge, huge miracle, you need to plant appropriately with your faith. Mm -hmm. And you plant little, you get, you get appropriate miracles in your giving. And Tonight we're going to receive our tithes and our offerings and we're going to have our seed faith march. Let's give the Lord a great big praise clap. Hallelujah. I want you to say with me, I love to give, love to, give. To, the to the work of God. Let's all stand and I want us to make our proclamation together as we look at our screens. Hallelujah. Amen. Lord Jesus, I come into your house, not empty-handed, but bringing my tithes and offerings according to Malachi 3.10. The windows of heaven are open to me. Blessings are being poured out that I cannot contain. The devourers rebuke for my sake. This year is a continuation of the Jubilee blessing. By faith, I have a better job. Promotions, raises, bonuses, and benefits. Business opportunities, sales, and commission increases. Inheritances, rebates, settlements, and checks in the mail. I expect favor, interest, royalties, and scholarships, gifts, surprises, and newfound monies. I'm using wisdom and self-control in my spending. My bills are decreasing and my income is increasing. I have the anointing for blessings equipping me to be a giver for the kingdom of God. All my needs are met and there is no lack. I have power to create wealth. The favor of God's upon me and everything I put my hand to will prosper. I'm a cheerful giver, sowing in good ground that's bringing souls into the kingdom of God, and my God is supplying all my needs. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Let's give the Lord a great big praise for that. Hallelujah. Father, we thank you for the privilege of giving to the work of God. And Lord, I ask that you would bless us bountifully in the name of Jesus. Every need is met for the glory of God. And everyone said, Amen. And you may be seated. And God bless these ushers as we receive our offering tonight. Oh, how beautiful are you, Lord. It's your word. It's your life. Lord, it's your power, it's your cross that saved me, that rescued me, just a moment then set me free. Stay in, God bless you, she come. I give you glory, glory, I give you glory.
God bless you. Tonight we're thrilled to have with us Sister Marilyn Hickey, and this is her third service uh, to minister tonight. And uh, you know, a lot of ministers, they minister one time, they go home and take a nap. Well, uh, I tell you, she's got so much spunk and energy. She's uh, third time around and then headed to Iran to preach over there. And let's give her a great big hand of welcome as she comes. Thank you. Wonderful to be with you tonight. And uh, where is the music director, the music pastor? Did he slip out? Is he close? I have a word for him. If you'll bring him in, that'll be great. And while we're waiting for him to come in, uh, I'd like to see how many partners I have here tonight. Would you raise your hand if you are a partner? Oh, you know, we pray for you every day, and you are such a blessing to us. And we have a gift for you that you can pick up back at our table at the end called Supernatural Strategy. God knows how to give you supernatural strategy. Amen? Amen. Now, how many of you are not partners? <laughs> well, that means you need to be. And so we have an envelope back there for you at the end. You can go back there and you can become a partner. The scripture I have for you is uh, Romans 8.31. It says, what shall we say then to these things? If God is for me, who can be against me? There are three things in your life that the enemy is using, but you need to speak to the thing itself. Not just tell people God is for me. The thing. What shall we say to the things. So speak to those three three things. Say God is for me so you can't be against me and the three things will drop. Amen. Let me pray for you. Father, I pray for my brother in this new position. Just fresh anointing upon him, fresh revelation. God, thank you that Jesus has made unto him wisdom, righteousness, sanctification, and redemption in Jesus' name. Amen. Bless you. Hallelujah. Now, there's something that I have that I really want you to have, and I'm going to need someone to come and stand with me for a moment to help me with a little visual. Who wants to volunteer to come up here and stand with me? You want to come up? Okay. Hold this bottle and open it, and I want to tell you about something that you can know what your gift is. You know, what is my gifting? What is my place in the body of Christ? And I used to really wonder, uh, what should I be doing? Because I was a pastor's wife. I didn't play the keyboard. Uh, I didn't like to roll bandages or make quilts, because that's what pastor's wives did then. <laughs> I just liked to teach the Bible. And I was just out of sync. And I remember one time an evangelist came to our church and he said, you're the worst example of a pastor's wife of anybody I know. You just don't fit. All you want to do is teach the Bible. And of course, those were penetrating words. And then I got hold of Romans 12. Romans 12 tells you seven giftings that come to members in the body of Christ. 
And when you see these, they are so wonderful. The first one is prophecy. That doesn't mean to prophesy. Doesn't mean a prophet. But they are very black and white and very discerning between evil and goodness. No question, my daughter has a prophecy motive because she really identifies things. Sometimes I think, could you be a little gray? Do you always just have to be quite so black and white? And so this is kind of the eye of the body, very discerning. But the second one is the hand, and this is the server. And of course, we have wonderful Bible examples of these, like Martha, like Ruth, she was a server. And so these people, they like to help with serving, keep the uh, sanctuary clean, pick up people, uh, babysit children. They just want to serve. That's the hand. Wonderful. But the third one is the ear of the body. Everybody say ear. ear. And faith comes by ear. and hearing by the word of God. And this person loves the word and they love to be taught the word and they are very discerning in a service. They'll say, now where do they get the scripture to do that? And they're always the Bible, the Bible, the Bible. They're hooked on the book. I thought, oh, that's what I am. No wonder I like to teach the Bible. And so that was the spiritual motive gift in my life. Then the fourth one is the exhorter. And the exhorter, and I tell you to draw kind of a three-leaf clover, this person likes people. They like to counsel. They like to be around people. Uh, they want the sermon to be very practical. If they think people aren't getting it, then that's a failure. And probably of the gifts here, they are the most popular because they're such people persons. The fifth one is the giver. And this person loves to give, but they love to motivate others to give, and they want to see all the bills and all the vision things. They want to see the finances met. And so you can put a dollar sign. The next one is the organizer, and you can put just the profile of a face. This person loves to set goals and develop people to meet those goals. Undoubtedly, Nehemiah had this gifting. And then the last one, and you can draw a heart, is mercy. And my husband, when he preached, it was always merciful. If he counseled you, it was merciful. If he prophesied, he prophesied in rhyme. It was merciful. I remember one time I was going out to counsel someone. He said, remember, be merciful. I said, I don't want to remember that. <laughs> they don't need mercy. And so those giftings... They really motivate and direct our life and what we like. And they also help us to know others. So why do I want this bottle of water? Because I think you can find your gifting. And you will love the book. You'll love the CDs that go with it. But if I poured a little water on the floor, you know, you had a prophecy motive. You would say, what are you doing? Pouring water in our beautiful carpet. You need to repent. If you were a server, you would say, wait a minute, I'll clean it up. I'll take care of it. If you were a teacher, you would say, where in the Bible do you get scripture for pouring water on the floor? If you were an exhorter, you would say, oh, what spiritual lesson is God trying to teach you? And so you always want it to apply in your life. If you're a giver, you say, not to worry, I'll buy more bottles of water. If you're an organizer, you'd say, let's get some volunteers here. We have Benny Hinn coming soon. We're going to need a lot of water. How many people will help? And so they set a goal, and they mo motivate people to reach it. The giver wants to pay for it. But the mercy, oh, if you're mercy, and I spilled a little water, you would say to me, wow, don't be embarrassed. The last person we had spilled water too. And so you would try to remove the embarrassment. Thank you. So one of those is yours. So look at someone. Say, honey, know your gift and know the gifts of others. Because it helps you understand why people aren't like you. I remember I always wanted everybody to teach the Bible. Thank you. I'll, I'll put the water back in case I need it. Give her a hand. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Now, 
think about this. If I really got hold of the giftings and could find them in the Bible, that could change my life and the life of others around me, couldn't it? And I could understand why Jeremiah cried all the time, and yet he was a prophet. I could understand. Why? Because he has a mercy motive. So not all of them had a mercy motive. Some of them just blasted everything, right? So you'll like those. They will be helpful to you, and they will help others. I have something that's free back there. Everybody say free. And it's a wonderful confession CD. You can put it in the car, listen to it at home, and confess scriptures on health and healing. Better to get healed and stay healthy. And Jehovah Rapha means the Lord our health. So that's free. Everybody say free. free. How many of you love that? <laughs> you say, I like free gifts. So do I. But you will especially like this because it has to do with your daily health walking in health. Now, one of the most exciting things I get to do in the whole world is take people through the Bible and see Jesus in every book of the Bible. Now, I love this because there are 66 books in the Bible, and a lot of Christians have never even read through the Bible. But when you start reading the Bible and seeing Jesus in those books, it takes you from glory to glory. So it's very important for you. So if I say, well, you know, I skip Leviticus, well, then you will skip that part of the glory of Jesus that you could have in your life. You say, well, you know, I never read the prophets. You could be profitless. Is that true? And you never see who Jesus is. And the, really, the major picture of Jesus in the Old Testament is Isaiah 53. Amen? And so all those prophets, they have a gorgeous picture of Jesus. So what happens as we read the Bible and we see who Jesus is in every book of the Bible, the Bible begins to read us. How many of you like the Bible to read you? Amen. Stand up. I'm going to pray for you. I just feel led to pray for you. Amen. That you crack the book and the book cracks you. Amen. Put your hand on your heart. Say, Father. Let the Bible read me. As I read the Word, may the Word read me. I thank you tonight for this revelation of Jesus Christ. I thank you, Lord. There are 66 levels of glory for me. Amen. Amen. Now put your hand on your head. Say, Lord, open my eyes. To behold wonders out of your word. Amen. Amen. All right, you can be seated. Now, if you're here tonight and you have this syllabus, which is really a study guide, not a book you're going to sit down and read through, but a guide that will help you as you go through the Bible, the Bible goes through you. How many of you have the study guide? Okay, you're going to need to turn to page 235 page 235, because we are going to look at Jesus in the prophets, because most people are not very profitable with prophets. And you're going to see him in some of the most unique ways you've ever seen him. Now you say, well, how much is that? Because it, it'll be a lifetime for you. This took almost a lifetime for me to put together, and I love to get people hooked on it. I just was on Benny Hinn's program in January doing this. How many of you saw it? And he had the most orders for this of anything he's ever offered. Oh, what did that say to me? People are getting open to the Bible. Hallelujah. And what the Bible can do in them. So these are $25. I'm going to be teaching out of it tonight. If you'd like to get yours right now, the ushers have them in a bag. But if you're charging, you will need to go to the back. But if you can write a check to MHM for 25 or you want to get two because you want to give one to a friend, raise your hand. Ushers will come to you. Or if you have exact cash, that would be great because you're going to use this all your life. This is not a temporary inspiration. This is a great tool that you're going to use. So keep your hand up when you're ready. And in your Bible, I would like you to open your Bibles 
to the book of Hosea. Now, you say, well, I didn't bring a Bible. Well, look around you. Smile at someone who did, and they will share with you because we're going to be in the Bible, and we're going to be in our syllabus very strongly. Now, while you're looking and getting your syllabus, let me tell you, Old Testament breaks into four segments. If you know where you're going, it's, you know when you get there. So basically, Old Testament, who was here this morning? What is it? Okay, tell me what's the first? Pentateuch. Everybody say Pentateuch. And we looked at Jesus in the Pentateuch. Then we see the next segment of books are history books. Joshua, Judges, Ruth. First and Second Samuel, First and Second Kings, First and Second Chronicles, Ezra, Nehemiah, Esther. Okay, so we see this part is history. Everybody say history. history. And then we see these gorgeous wisdom books. There are five of them. There's Job, Psalms, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, Song of Solomon. They're also called poetry books, wisdom books. A lot of people really like Psalms and Proverbs. Some people like Ecclesiastes, and not very many people like Song of Solomon. But you'll love what I share with you of Song of Solomon in here. It's an opera. And when you read it as an opera, you see how much he loves you. It's very wonderful. So I'm sharing that with you in that. In the book of Psalms, and again, that's, this is all in your wonderful study guide. In the book of Psalms, it divides into five sections because Psalms was a songbook. And so they divided it like the Pentateuch. So if you wanted to sing Psalms about, you know, God's sovereignty, uh, God's solidity in your life, you would look in the first 42 Psalms and you'd pick out a Psalm that would minister to you. Those were called Genesis Psalms. But if you needed deliverance, oh my, you just need to get set free. You would look in the next section of Psalms, and they have to do with deliverance, God's redemption power. And so you would pick out one of those to sing or to memorize or to meditate. Exodus Psalms, getting free. Then the next grouping of Psalms, and again, I'm not teaching from this, I'm just sharing what you get when you get it, is Leviticus Psalms. And they are Psalms of the sanctuary. What to do, how to worship him, who our high priest is. Then the next grouping of Psalms is history. So, you know, sometimes you need to go back and rehearse your victories. Amen? I'm going to tell you, I had said for many years, I'm believing God for a million dollar gift because we were doing such big things around the world and we reach over three billion people every weekday. And, uh, you know, it's very expensive when you do these things. So I said, I don't know how many years our staff prayed we'd have a million dollar gift. So I'm invited to do a big me healing meeting in Uganda, in Kampala, and that's a very poor country. I think average people maybe make $300 a year. So I'm there, I'm kind of relaxing, resting out in the sunshine before the evening uh, crusade. And a woman came over to me and she said, are you Marilyn Hickey? I said, yes. Well, she said, we watch you on television. Do you know she gave me a million dollars? What? You say, that's crazy. The biggest gift I ever received was from Uganda. <laughs> Hallelujah. Now, why did I tell you that with numbers? Because I rehearsed that history. And I say, I got another one coming. Doesn't have to be Uganda. Because I don't know if I'm going there soon. But you rehearse your victories. If he healed me of this, if he did that. So it's a rehearsing of victories. And then Deuteronomy. Oh, my goodness. These Deuteronomy Psalms all have to do with the word. Like Psalm 119 is considered a Deuteronomy Psalm. So they had a song book. They knew where to look for what song or psalm they needed for the day, the occasion in their lives. And all that breakdown is in there. Oh, it is wonderful. Then I have a breakdown of Proverbs. Everybody say Proverbs. Did you know that Proverbs was written to be sung? It, you were supposed to sing it. And so when Solomon was growing up, he tells you this, my mother and my father taught me wisdom. They said, whatever you do, get 
wisdom. So when Solomon becomes the king, God speaks to him in the night and says, what would you like? What would he say? Wisdom. And his mother and father taught him to sing those proverbs, those wisdom, pithy little wisdoms. And of course, when he grew up, he wanted that. And he was considered, outside of Jesus, the wisest of men. Amen? I'm telling you, when you get into this, you'll get hooked on Proverbs. Maybe you already are, but you'll get hooked some more. You will just love it. But tonight, we're in the fourth part of Old Testament, and what are we into? The prophets. So look at somebody. Say, honey, this is really going to be profitable. <laughs> okay. Now, when we look at the prophets, we find out there are major prophets and minor prophets. So what does that mean? Just means they wrote longer books if they were a major prophet. So when you read Isaiah, when you read Jeremiah, when you read Ezekiel, of course, Lamentations, uh, after Jeremiah, when you read Daniel, those are long prophets. So they are considered major prophets. The other prophets are considered minor, not that their message was minor, but they were smaller books. And Jesus is so beautifully revealed in the prophets. When Jeremiah, when Jesus came on the earth, they said to Jesus, are you Jeremiah? Because Jeremiah was so merciful, they saw that in Jesus. And they had read Jeremiah. They knew how he wept. We know how he wept over Jerusalem. So these are beautiful pictures of Jesus in these Old Testament books. But the one I have chosen for tonight, I feel the Holy Spirit has chosen for you, is Hosea. Everybody say Hosea. Hosea. Now Hosea is not a long prophet, it's a minor prophet. But it has one of the most gorgeous pictures of Jesus I've ever seen in my life. And in the book of Hosea, we see Hosea is a prophet. And God speaks to him and says, I want you to marry a woman who was a prostitute, and her name is Gomer. Now, he goes, and he does what God tells him. He marries Gomer. Well, she's fine for a while, and they have a little boy named Jezreel. And of course, I tell you that it's in here in this section. And Jezreel means planted by God. So this little boy, planted by God, Hosea and Gomer, you know, they are the parents of this boy. But then she began to be restless and, you know, kind of wanted her old life back. And so she leaves him, but she comes home periodically. And she has a little girl. And they call the little girl Loami. Why do they put the low in front of it? Low always means no. Put your hand on your heart. Say, I won't forget. Low means no. So Loami means you are not mine. You are not mine. So she brought this child that was not Hosea's home for Hosea to raise. Then she goes out again, leaves the home, deserts her children, and she has another little girl named Lo Ruhema. What does Lo mean? Yeah. No or not, right. So it means I will not have mercy on you. So she brings another child home for Hosea to raise that is not his child. And so Hosea begins to speak to his children in chapter 2. And he says to them, tell your mother to come home. You know, and I noticed it doesn't call them Loruhema, doesn't call them Loami, calls them Ami, which means you are mine. It calls them uh, Ruhema, which means I will have mercy on you. So I think, wow, what's going on here that we get this name change? And I find out why they get the name change. Because, listen to me closely, one believing mate sanctifies the household. And Hosea believed for those children. How many of you have a marriage where your mate not saved or divorced from an unsaved person? Stand up. Stand up. You say, what's going to happen to my children? 
you're going to sanctify them. You're not going to give up. Is that true? Your faith can keep your children. And this is what I have done. My husband born again, Spiritfield Christian. But I held on to Michael, especially who got into the drug scene, the alcohol, and all of that. And I said, Lord, he's the seed of the righteous. He is delivered. And you just hold on. Because it only takes one, two or better, but one. Everybody point to yourself, so I'm the one. I can have faith. And so you have faith to sanctify your children. And he had the faith. And you can say, well, it's not fair. Folks, just shut up. <laughs> Saying it's not fair doesn't change anything. Faith changes things. Amen. Amen. Uh, you know, in this life, don't figure out what's fair and what's not fair. Because it's probably going to be unfair. But faith changes unfair things. So sit down, all you wonderful faith parents. You're just standing in faith that they will come back. They will serve God. Your children will serve God. They're sanctified by your faith. But then something else goes on. You know, he says, you know, go tell your mother to come home. Now, if you had three children, little children, and they said, Mama, please come home. We're tired of Campbell's soup. We're tired of frozen dinners. You know, we need clean underwear. Please come home. Now, you would think that would touch a woman with three little children. Or even that would touch a man who had little children. Their children come to them. But I want to tell you something. It won't work. You say, why won't it? Because Hosea 4.11 says, new wine and adultery take away the natural affection. So we try to deal with alcoholics with natural affection. Well, you ought to love your wife, or you ought to love your husband, you ought to love your children. It takes that emotion away. And also, people who get in affairs, sleeping here, there, all kinds of lust, takes away natural affection. So if you try to deal with these people with natural affection, you ought to love your children, you ought to love your mate, it won't work. So let's see what can work. And let's see the gorgeous, gorgeous picture of Jesus Christ here. So God tells him what to do. He said, I'm going to deal with Gomer. I'm going to take her out, and I'm going to make her repulsive to her lovers. So Gomer, you know, she's sleeping with all these men. She's getting all kinds of lovely gifts. And then suddenly, nobody wants to sleep with her anymore. They say, well, what's wrong? Well, she doesn't shave her legs. She uses the wrong kind of deodorant. She smells. And suddenly, she has no lovers. Who's behind this? God is behind this. So she ends up on a slave block because she doesn't have any money. And she has no lover. She has no way to make money. And she's left her husband and her children. And God speaks to Hosea to go and buy her. And he buys her back as his wife. Now listen, if he buys her as a slave from the slave block, he can kill her. He can do anything to her because she's his slave. But he told her, I'm not buying you as my slave. I'm buying you as my wife. And you can call me Ishi, I-S-H-I. And it's right in your Bible. You say you're making this up. No, I'm not. Ishi means my husband. He said, I'll treat you so good. I'm your husband, and I love you with unfailing love. Now, what happens? Well, you never read again. She stepped out on him. I think they had a slap happy marriage. Amen. I think their children, Jezreel, Amy, Ruhama, I think they were so blessed with parents. Now, you say, well, what does this have to do with Jesus? Everything. Okay. Jesus, the Father, had a plan for Israel. I love Israel. Who doesn't love Israel? Pray for them every day. He loved Israel. But Israel got into idolatry and really 
went the other direction. And finally, you know, they were ju judged, and then Rome eventually, and so very serious time. So in a sense, Israel has played the harlot with the father. So what does the father do? He sends his son, Jesus Christ, their Messiah, and they refuse him, right? And so what is Jesus going to do? Jesus is going to buy them from the slave block and bring them back, and it says, they will look on him whom they have pierced, and a nation will be saved in a day. Amen. 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 Now, let's think about it for ourselves. Were you the sweetest thing no. since sliced bread when you were a sinner? No. You know, you were a mess, let's face it. Look at someone and say, honey, you used to be a mess. How did Jesus find you? Oh, the sweetest little thing. No, he brought you on the slave market of sin. Amen. Is that true? Amen. And he took you, and he didn't say, if you don't behave, you're out of this picture. Amen. He loved you with unfailing love. You. you are his beloved. I'm always astounded at how much he loves me. I'm astounded that New Testament most of the time calls Christians saints. You know, if somebody said, how are you? And I said, I'm St. Marilyn. You'd say, give me a break. <laughs> and so what are we saying about all of this? That we were bought off a slave block. We were sinners. And what did he give us? Mercy. He planted us. Is that true? And he makes us his. I am his for all eternity. And his love is so eternal. It says, the greatest, their faith, hope, and love, 1 Corinthians 13, 13, and the greatest of these is love. Yeah. You, why does he say the greatest? Because faith is wonderful. Hope is wonderful. Because when you go to heaven, you won't need faith. Right. You won't need hope. Yeah. But his love is eternal. Amen. 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 It is the most gorgeous, unconditional love. So Hosea is this gorgeous picture of Jesus you know, going to the slave block, paying with his blood so that we might have redemption. And Hosea means salvation. So you say, well, you could miss that in some of these. Absolutely. But I want to take another one with you. How are you doing? Are you okay? I want to give this man a scripture right here in the yellow shirt. It's Psalm 138.8, he's perfecting the things that concern you. What you're worried about, he's perfecting. And I have two more scriptures. 1 Peter 5.7 says, casting all your care on him, for he cares for you. But the next scripture, 8, says the devil goes about as a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. If you cast your cares on the Lord, the devil can't devour you. When you carry the cares, it gives the enemy an opportunity to chew on you. Put up both your hands. Say, goodbye, cares. I'm not worried. I'm not getting devoured. I'm getting miracles. Amen. 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 And so let's just look at another prophet, very profitable. Let's look to the book of Daniel. So turn. In your study guide, you'll have to go backwards to the book of Daniel. Now, Daniel, you talk about bad situations, and this will be on page 227. Daniel is considered a major prophet because he has 12 chapters. It's a longer prophet. So when we look at Daniel, we see he is a slave. He's in a very bad situation. I love this about the Bible. It's written for bad situations because the Bible brings transformation. It is wonderful. And so he taken as a slave, taken from his country, you know, very smart young man, very nice looking, very well educated. And he's with three friends, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, because they changed their names. 
you know, because they change them to names of their God. So Nebuchadnezzar takes them, brings them into Babylon, and they are slaves. Now you say, I just feel like I'm a slave to these things. Everything is such pressure on me. But let's, let's watch the picture about Jesus coming into this situation. You say, you don't know how hard it is where I work. You don't know how hard my mate is. You don't know hard, how hard my health things are. No, I don't. But I know someone who does. So he's taken into captivity. And right away, they see these four young men. Oh, man, you know, they're good looking. They're smart. They're young. They're healthy. You know, they're educated. They carry themselves well. So they're going to put them in this special class to teach them. So uh, they're in that class, but they're supposed to eat the meat and the drink that Nebuchadnezzar orders for them. So Daniel feels that they shouldn't do that. So he goes to the head of all of the eunuchs. And by the way, a eunuch means that, you know, he, he can never have a child. He can never marry a father or a child. He is a eunuch. So don't tell me your situation is worse than his. It's really, really bad. So he says to the three Hebrew children, you know, it's not good for us to eat these things. So they go to the head of the eunuchs, and God gives them favor. Everybody say favor. favor. Now stand up. I have a scripture for everybody. Psalms 512 says, he surrounds the righteous with favor like a shield. Godly favor protects you in every situation. You know, I go to all these Muslim countries all the time. <laughs> I've been to Pakistan six times. Why don't they shoot you? You're a woman, they hate women. And you teach the Bible, they hate the Bible. And you're an old woman. That's such an advantage. They think I'm old, I'm a woman, that makes me stupid, I'm weak, so I do everything. <laughs> Favor. Amen. Muslims just love me. I have a new book out called Dinner with Muhammad, and uh, Mike Huckabee wants me to be on his program with that. What is that? That's favor. Now look at someone. Say, honey, you're surrounded with favor like a shield. It protects you. So this favor around these four young people is very protecting. You can be seated. Now, folks, favor doesn't work unless you proclaim it. So when you get up in the morning, say, I'm surrounded with favor, like a shield. I love people. People love me. Oh, they just love me. And I'm saying this because I like to witness to people on airplanes. I love sinners, and sinners are wild over me. Because, you know, they can't get out till we land. So you just hang in there real tight with them. So they have favor. And so they eat the special things they're supposed to eat. And at the end of the testing time, wow. They're healthier than the rest of the crowd, but they're also 10 times smarter because favor makes you wise. It really does. Favor is so key for us. So here they are, 10 times wiser. And Nebuchadnezzar, and by the way, Nebuchadnezzar means a broken ceramic. That's a crackpot. So Nebuchadnezzar has a dream. And in this dream, he sees this figure, but he can't remember the dream, but it's so powerful to him. So he calls his wise men to tell him the dream. Well, they said, no, we can't tell you the dream. You tell us the dream, then we'll interpret. No, no, you tell me the dream. So he's going to kill the wise men, and Daniel says, no, 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 don't do that. Let us pray. So he and his friends, what do they do? They pray all night, and Daniel becomes a man of perception. He's a man of prayer. I call him the 3P man. He prays and he perceives. He gets the dream. And so then they tell Nebuchadnezzar, this is the dream. The head of gold, that's your empire. The arms of silver, you know, and of course that would be the Medes and the Persians. The stomach of brass, which would be the Greeks. And the legs of iron, which would be the Roman Empire, which had two capitals. One at Rome, one at Constantinople. And so he tells them that dream. The king is so touched by this, he really elevates them and gives him a very high position. But then the king has another dream. And folks, God will give you perception. 
Because as you read the Bible, the Bible reads you, you become sensitive to what he wants to say to you. I had a very bad dream the other night. And so I got up in the morning and I said, Lord, why did I have such a bad dream? He said, because you've been confessing bad things about this. And it affects your dream life. Perception. So I said, I repent. Shut up, Marilyn. Don't say negative things. Right? And so you begin to have spiritual perception. The king has another dream. And in this dream, he sees seven years of really good things happening. And then he sees himself falling and becoming, acting like an animal for seven years. Like he's crazy. I told you, his name means a crackpot. And at the end of seven years, he lifts his eyes, and he's changed and transformed. So he says to him, King Nebuchadnezzar, you are a mighty man, but be careful because you are a man of pride, and God can abase those who are prideful. And you will lose your mind for seven years, but at the end of seven years, you will look up to him instead of having people look up to you, and your senses will return. Perception. Everybody say perception. perception. You know, folks, God will give you perception about your children. I remember one time when Sarah was in Germany, and I was in South Korea, and God showed me something that was going on in her life that the enemy wanted to kill her. I'm telling you, I jumped out of the bed and began to pray in the Spirit. And when we talked, that very thing that night had happened. And the devil was trying to wipe her out, only he lost. Why? Spiritual perception. Everybody say spiritual perception. One time I was in Kazakhstan. I never get sick overseas. And I got dreadfully sick. I was in so much pain. Some way it was my stomach, and I never have anything like that. I was in so much pain, I just said, oh, God, I'd like to die then go on with this pain. Tell Wally about it. So I got over it. God touched my body. I finished, went to Uzbekistan. When I got home, Wally said, Marilyn, there was a certain night I was asleep, and I heard your voice, and you said, Wally, Wally, he said, and you were in such agony, I woke up and said, devil, take your hands off her. Perception. Is it for all believers or just Daniel? Say, perception is for me. Prayer is for me. So Nebuchadnezzar doesn't repent of his pride. You remember he sets up that tall image and he calls on everyone to bow down and worship. And the three Hebrew children won't do it. They're thrown in. They said, and I love what they said. They said, our God is able to deliver us. And God said to me, that's faith. They said, but if he doesn't, we still won't bow down. And God said, that's faithfulness. And you know, folks, sometimes I've prayed for people and believed for them to live, and they died. And God said that to me. Many people are raised, many miracles, but sometimes they die. Will you be faithful when it seems like your faith has failed? God grows faith in us. And what else? Faithfulness. Look at someone. Say, honey, this is really good for you. Okay, so now the three Hebrew children thrown in the burning fiery furnace, only the fourth one shows up. And who is it? Jesus loves to show up in your fiery furnace. <laughs> and he likes to show up and show off. Amen? So he shows up. And Nebuchadnezzar, the crackpot, sees him and calls them to come out and said, I see one like the Son of God, the revelation of Jesus. Is that wonderful? But he still lives in pride. And one day he gets up and says, look at this great empire I have built. And he goes crazy. And he acts like an animal. His nails grow out. His hair grows out. And you know, the Hanging Gardens of Babylon, one of the wonders of the ancient world, seven wonders. And can't you imagine somebody driving in a chariot, coming up to the palace, 
and some crazy looking thing peeks through the bushes and goes bark, bark, has long hair and long nails. He said, what is that creature? Oh, that's the king. He's just as crazy as he can be. <laughs> Hallelujah. Now watch. At the end of seven years, he lifted up his eyes and he worshiped the Lord. When you go to heaven, you'll see Nebuchadnezzar. Because God can take crackpots and make them whole. Amen? Amen? Amen. And so I encourage you tonight. You know, you meet crackpots, maybe you are one. But God can put it back together for you. And so after this happened, he promotes Daniel into power. So Daniel and the three Hebrew children are men of prayer, men of perception, and men of power. And God gives us power. Everybody say power. And the demonstration of his power is what really touches people. One time I was in Pakistan, and I saw how this worked in the Lord. And they asked me, they said, would you like to be on a program, kind of an interview program on healing? It's a program called Good Morning Pakistan. I said, well, tell me what it's about, because, man, if you say the wrong thing over there, they closed down my meeting, I'd never get back in. So I really wanted to be sure I had perception from God. So I said, well, what will they do? Will they just call in and ask you questions about healing? Well, I felt in my heart I should do it. So I really prayed about it, went on the program, it's our long program, and people are calling in, and I'm telling about healings and miracles that are going on in our big nightly meetings. And one woman called in, she said, well, you say you always pray in the name of Jesus, but couldn't you pray in the name of Mohammed and get the same results? Perception. I heard myself say this. I'm not this smart. I said, well, I don't know. I've never prayed in the name of Muhammad. I don't know how that works. But I've prayed a lot in the name of Jesus, and it works a lot. Amen. People were healed. Even when I went to the airport, people said, I saw you on that program. I got healed. Perception. Everybody say perception. And when you move in prayer and perception... Folks, you'll move in power. And God wants his people to move in power. Am I right? Yes. And so it is very key that we see who Jesus is. And then, of course, when you go to the rest of the book of Daniel, you see these beautiful examples of those four empires again. And then, oh, he gives you a revelation in the prophetic part that is just out of this world about Jesus Christ. So you could miss who Jesus is. You could miss prayer, perception, and power. Am I right? If you never read Daniel. So are these prophets profitable? Do, will they help you? All of them? Or just a few? All of them will help. You could miss Hosea and miss one of the greatest revelations of who Jesus is, how he buys you off a slave block. <laughs> and becomes your husband, your lover, and is not going to kill you, but going to love you. Amen. Amen? Amen? So prophets, profitable for us, and quoted in the New Testament. Now, what did Jesus quote from primarily? He quoted primarily from Psalms, and I'll share that in here, and he quoted from Deuteronomy. Those were the two major books he quoted from. So I show you how those books are quoted in the New Testament. Because people say, I never read the Old Testament. Well, if you're reading the New Testament, you're reading some of the Old Testament. Because Jesus is quoting it. And that's the foundation. How are you? Are you cool? You're cool? Okay, I'm just going to do a few more things. And then I just feel led to go into the audience and give scriptures out. Are you okay with that? Okay. Let me just share a couple things with you. In going through the prophets, you will see some with a revelation of Jesus that you've never seen a revelation of him like that before. I look forward to you getting the syllabus, getting the study guide, and seeing Jesus in those prophets. Haggai, Zechariah has some of the most gorgeous pictures of Jesus. Habakkuk, 
oh, out of this world. But what makes it so out of this world is that you see Jesus. What changed Nebuchadnezzar? Tell me what changed Nebuchadnezzar. What changed him? He saw Jesus. Is that right? Did he see him in the burning, fiery furnace? Yes. Did he, <laughs> did he see him when he lifted up his eyes and his sanity came back? And then he said something early, and he has kind of a process of revelation. He said, your God is a king of kings, Lord of lords, and revealer of secrets. That's the Trinity. He's a God of gods. Jesus is king of kings, and the Holy Spirit leads you into all truth. The process of revelation. So reading through your Bible, letting your Bible read through you, that's so important. Now, when I give scriptures out, uh, you say, well, that's prophecy. Well, kind of, but it's also promise. So if I give this lady a promise, and if it's a man back here, could he take it? Yes, because are all the promises available? Does he say that? All the promises are yes and amen to the glory of God through us. So he's saying, yes, all these promises are yours. So don't sit there and say, well, nobody ever gives me a prophecy or nobody ever gives me a promise. Crack the book, honey. It's full of them. And you can underline them and you can claim them for yourself. I want to give you uh, 2 Corinthians 4.13. It says, since we have the same spirit of faith uh, as it is written, I believed and I spoke, we also believe and therefore speak. You are believing and you are speaking, but you are entering into also a company of people that are believing and speaking the same thing. And it's a company of faith and that company of faith will move the mountain. Mark eleven twenty three. Whosoever so shall say to this mountain, Be thou removed, cast in the sea, shall not doubt in his heart, but believe that those things which he saith shall come to pass. He shall have whatsoever he saith. Why should you speak to the mountain? Because there's something good on the other side. And if you don't speak to it, you'll never get the good on the other side. So move in a company of faith. And I think you know who some of those faith people are who will speak what you speak. But also there are some new ones coming in. It's a company of faith. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Uh, this man right here in kind of a rush shirt. Uh, I want you to stand up. <clears throat> uh, this is Deuteronomy 30, 20. It says, as your days are, so shall your strength be. And here's something God says to me about you in this verse. It says that you may love him, obey him, cling to him. You love him. You obey him. You cling to him. And you're not going to get feeble. You're just going to get better. Because as your days are, so shall your strength be. <laughs> Amen. Amen. <laughs> Thank you, Jesus. I guess my favorite scripture almost, if I could have a favorite, is Proverbs 6.22. And see this wonderful looking man in the t-shirt here? Stand up. <laughs> I, I, I love this scripture. It says that uh, when you wake up, the word will talk to you. When you walk, the word will guide you. And when you sleep, the word will keep you. And the word is become, going to become such a passion and a fire to you that when you get up in the morning, you want to read the word. And then during the day, you think, well, I think I'll just crack my Bible a little bit. And before you go to sleep, maybe you like ice cream, but you're going to like the word too. <laughs> and that word will keep you and speak to you in the night. Amen. Praise the Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Everyone put your hand on your heart. Say, God, give me a greater hunger for your word. That's so key for us. That's so key. I want to give this young man right here in a turquoise shirt. Would you stand up? 
And this is a wonderful scripture. It's John 8, 12. It says, I am the light of the world. He that follows me shall not walk in darkness, but have the light of life. Sometimes you think, is the light on? But if you'll follow Jesus, he'll always keep the light on. And you don't have to look backward. You can look up. You don't have to look forward and worry. You can look up because he'll be your light day by day. Amen? Put your hand on your head. I'm going to pray for you. Say, Father, thank you for Jesus who brings light into my life. And light dispels darkness. Amen. 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 Praise the Lord. I want to minister to this lady right here. And it's in uh, Psalm 139. It's, and it's verse 5. It says, you've hedged me behind and before, and you've laid your hand on me. God has you covered in the back and in the front, and he's got his hand on you. I mean, you are covered, honey. So not to worry about it. Amen? Amen. Praise the Lord. I love Romans 8. Don't you love Romans 8? Oh, that's such a gorgeous ch chapter. And I have a scripture for you in Romans 8, 2. It says, The law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus sets you free from the law of sin and death. So it's the law of life. So there is energy and life in the Word. And you're going to find suddenly you have a breakthrough of energy. Not that you've been tired, but that you're going into another realm of energy that will shock you. And you're going to have clarity of thinking and excellent recall and a blessed memory. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Now, tomorrow night, we're going to lay hands on everybody, right? But tomorrow night, we do the New Testament. So we're going to do Revelation. Everybody say Revelation. And so you will need to look at it in your study guide before you come. And you know, folks, it's not just us getting hooked on the book. Let's get other people. You know, we give them candy, make them fat, we give them flowers. They will give them God's Word and change their lives. So you say, well, you know, who's right about Revelation? Everybody teaches differently. I am. <laughs> this is one of the books I've memorized. I love it, love to teach it. And it's not hard. You will love tomorrow night. And it's a good time to bring people because we're laying hands on people. Amen? And you don't have to say to them, oh, we're going to study the book of Revelation. That might make them pass out. But just sneakily say, oh, it's going to be a power night. You need to be there. Yeah. Then when they're in the car, you can say, we're going to study Revelation. <laughs> That's kind of sneaky. I want to share something with you about China. Everybody say China. China. I've been in China 32 times. I'm going again in May. That'll be 33. I started going to China in 89, and at that time, the churches were all underground, and we would take Bibles in because hardly any of the Christians had Bibles. And so I would take teams of people. Anybody here that went to China with me? Sometimes, okay, you went with me. Who else? Anyone else? I'm just checking it out because I've gone to China so many times and taken teams in. So we would sneak Bibles in. And the way, and we'd pray that we didn't get caught. It didn't, they wouldn't hurt us, but they'd take the Bibles away. And so we'd never see them again. The people wouldn't get them. So we would take an extra piece of hand luggage, pretty big, and we would pack these small paper-bound Bibles in there. So we took thousands of Bibles in. Well, when you get off the plane, you pick up your luggage. You pick up this one with your luggage. Then you have to put it through a scanner. Only the scanners would break. We never had anybody get caught. I'm sure I took in over a half a million Bibles. The scanners would be broken or somebody wouldn't show up to turn it on. One woman, they said to her, open your bag. And she said, she acted like she couldn't hear. Open the bag. They said, go on. <laughs> I mean, we would do night tracking. We'd go out at night, and they live in big apartment buildings. 
And we'd put tracks in every mailbox. We'd go out between 2 and 4 in the morning. People would get saved, never had an opportunity, you know, to know Jesus. And maybe that was their only one. But now China has a lot more openness. So we're taking a team of people with us in May. You can go. We go May 8th. We come back May 20th. Only we have three big open doors to preach in big arenas in China. And we went into China, this Kunming I'll show you, just short. And uh, they told us, now, you know, you can't uh, you have to be real careful about altar calls, you know, because the communists watch our church. So we went, and they baptized when we left 227 people. God saved. Healings and miracles all over the place. But the woman guide, we had 125 people who went with us. And the woman guide that we had, uh, she was very secular and very nice, probably 46, 47. So I said, Chong, uh, I'd like to have coffee with you. She said, I don't want to have coffee with you. So I said, well, what about lunch? You know, don't give up, just hang in. I said, what about lunch? She said, I don't want to have lunch with you. I said, well, come to the service tonight. She said, you don't understand. I'm an atheist. I'm a communist. I'm an atheist. I don't believe in God. So we had our service that night, and you'll see it. And I didn't know it, but she came. We had about 3,000 people. So the next day she saw me. She said, oh, I couldn't get over that DVD of Pakistan that you had. She said, that is awesome. I said, well, let's have, have coffee. I don't want to have coffee with you. I said, well, what about lunch? Because it was our last day, our last service. She said, I don't want to have lunch with you. I said, well, I have a service tonight. You just love it. You need to come. She said, you don't get it. I am an atheist. I am not coming. But you know, inside, you just don't know how to give up. Put your hand on your heart. Say, I don't know how to give up. I just know how to win. <laughs> so, you know, I prayed. Well, that night... We had healings and miracles all over the place. I didn't see her. I'm going out to the van to get in the van to leave. And all at once, here comes Chong running, knocks on the window. I got out. She said, Marilyn, I came to tell you goodbye. I was in the service. And the Lord said to me, get her and get her now. I said, Chong, do you have Jesus in your heart? She said, no. I said, Chong, would you like to? She said, yes. She got beautifully saved. Her son from a university is saved. I hear from her. And I used to be afraid of atheists. I'm not afraid of atheists. I think, bring me 10. <laughs> Hallelujah. So watch this. It will really warm your heart. This is Kunming which is called the Garden City. Sarah was with me. This is the church we went to. This is an above-ground church. Now, you know, underground churches can be above ground, too. This is the service. You can see some of our team there. Oh, they worship. It was wonderful. This is their choir. We were quite astounded at how strong evangelical it was. The pastor, his wife is spirit-filled. I think he is too, he just doesn't tell it. Had a wonderful interpreter. Sarah was with me, she preached too. And he told us, now don't uh, don't invite people to speak in tongues. Here's Sarah preaching. And so we said, oh, we won't do that. But, you know, we had that team of 125 people. So when they came forward to get prayer, they start falling under the power and speaking in tongues. <laughs> we just have such a cool God, isn't he? <laughs> he just shows up and shows off. So China, they're telling us now in The Economist magazine that there are more Christians in China than Communist Party members. You know, you don't have to slip Bibles in now. But I thought, Pastor Bob, of all the seed that you have sown, you know, 
through the years, all the missionaries, your father, you've sent out all around the world. And this church has stood behind everything and really committed to it. That is just wonderful. You know, don't you think those will be rewards coming back to you? I think a lot of the blessings in my life and I see in my grandchildren's lives are from sowing seed over seed. I think it just comes back. And it says, blessed are they who sow beside all waters. So put your hand on your heart. Say, I'm so blessed. I sow beside all waters. I thank you, Lord, for harvests that are coming to me. Amen. Now, I want to share and ask you to sow seed. And of course, your seed will help me to go into Iran. You say, how are you getting into Iran? Well, it's kind of sneaky, because they've never had an open healing meeting there ever in the history. So we've asked to have a cultural exchange and go to a university, and they present what the Quran says about Jesus, and they, have, they mention Jesus 97 times in the Quran, and they say he heals. And then I will teach what the Bible says about Jesus, and then heal the sick. I'm telling you, the Muslims love demonstration, and we got the one who demonstrates. And so that's what's cooking. That's one of the things that we are doing. But I want to encourage you also, we're going back to Pakistan, and we are also going to Brazil. Now, China trip, you can go with me, and at the back you can pick up our brochure on it, and I'd love to have you go along. It'd be good. Take your grandchildren. Get the world in their heart. I said to Sarah one time when she started traveling with her children, I said, Sarah, how do you do it, taking your children? Well, she said, you took me. How do you think I got turned on to the world? So she takes her children because she wants them to have the world inside. So that's very exciting to me. One other thing I didn't tell you, I have a Jesus Revealed Bible. Everybody say, Jesus, Jesus. Revealed Bible. And so this is a Bible I use. It's small. It fits in my purse. I, and I underline it. But it also tells me who Jesus is in every book. And it, it will go with this wonderful study guide that you're going to buy if you don't have it yet. And you're certainly going to read Revelation for tomorrow night. Amen? Amen. Okay. Seed sowing. Everybody say seed. seed. Now your tithe belongs to your church. Say my tithe, my tithe. Belongs, belongs to my church. my church. How many of you here, you don't have a church? Put your hand up real high. Okay, stand up. You don't have a church. Pastor Bob, would you stand up? Now you have a pastor, and this is your church, and you got the best. You got the best. So what I am asking you to sow tonight is seed, but I'm asking you to sow expecting a harvest. Everybody say, expecting a harvest, because our seed goes to all waters. So I believe as you sow in this to help us cover the earth with the word, help us go to Iran, Pakistan, China, Brazil, and these other countries, that God is going to bring back a harvest. Because it says seed time and harvest will never end. And folks, I think so many times we think, well, you know, where is God? Yeah, he's Jehovah Jireh. He's our provider, but I don't see him. But I saw this very strongly in the word not too long ago that here was Abraham taking Isaac up the mountain to be the sacrifice. But on the other side of the mountain, the ram was coming. And the ram got up there in time. Amen? And so we sow our seed and think, where's Jehovah Jireh? Honey, he's on the way. Everybody say, the ram is coming. The ram is coming. Amen. And so I encourage you tonight to listen to the Holy Spirit and to sow. Now, Patsy, come and bring this up because you can do this. You know, we have these special things that help us with our international ministry. And when you sow a seed, let's hold up the healing, uh, African. When you sow a seed of $150, this is back at our table so you can pick it up. We have this beautiful prayer cloth. It's the biggest one you've ever seen. So they won't carry it in their pocket. They'll cover up with it. 
But we have prayed over these. There would be a special anointing. And I have a really good friend in Hungary. They have this little church of 100,000 people. And he told me about a woman in his church whose husband was in jail, going to go to prison. He was in the mafia. So she had a handkerchief. And she said, Pastor, would you pray over this? She said, my husband, he's a terrible sinner. And I want to take this because he needs deliverance. So he prayed. So she takes it to the prison, meets her husband in the ready room. And she tells her husband about the handkerchief. And he said, I don't want a handkerchief that your pastor prayed over. And he curses her. And she said, you're desperate. You're going to go to prison. You're going to hell. And so she presses it into his hand. She's crying. When it touched his hand, he fell on the floor and began to roll and cry and said, God, have mercy on me. I'm a sinner. Well, the guards are watching and think, what's wrong with this crazy man? So they go over, and they bend down to touch him. And when they touched him, they fell. And they began to roll and cry out for mercy. Well, finally, they got themselves together, took him back to the cell, three other men in his cell. And they said, why have you been crying? Why are you so disheveled? So he tells them the story of the handkerchief. They said, that is phony baloney. He said, then you touch it. He got out of, they fell, but he got out of prison, has a church in downtown Budapest for mafia people because of the transference of anointing. Everybody say transference of anointing. And so we got the biggest prayer cloth in the world. Sarah and I have laid hands on these that there's a transference of healing, and those are available. But if you're getting one, you know, you'll need to take your seed back there. And then I love this. We have these children's comfort blankets, and they are just great because we have them in pink and blue. We've prayed over these that the child whose body touches this will fulfill the destiny God has for them. And so we have scriptures that I quoted when Sarah was in my womb, scriptures that she quoted over her three, and they are going to fulfill. God has a destiny and a plan. Amen? And so these are like a $50 seed. We have them in pink and blue, and they're available back there. Now, how many of you would like to sow a seed, a Jehovah Jireh seed, for the ram that's coming up? You say, I have some future needs coming up, and I'd like to sow a seed. Put your hand up really high. Everyone sow a seed. Everyone. So I'm going to ask the ushers if they would pass out the envelopes. Then we're going to pray. We're going to pray. Ask God to show you what to sow. Now, when we go to Iran, and you helped this morning, and I appreciate that, it, our budget for Iran the first time will probably be around $25,000. It's expensive to do these things. But when we do a big meeting, you know, like in China, like that, that's much more expensive. You know, we, we'll have maybe sixty, seventy thousand dollars $70,000 in that. But when we go to Pakistan, have over 200,000 people, it can be one hundred and fifty to $200,000. Because we also feed the pastors, and we do, you know, things to help them put books in their language. We always leave books in their language. That is so key. So keep your hand up very high, very high till you get your envelope. And I want everyone to sow. So look at someone and say, Honey, this is a Jehovah Jireh special offering. Your provider is providing the seed and the harvest. Expect a big harvest. Don't expect little things. Amen? Now remember, if God could give me a million dollars in Uganda, what can he do with your seed? You say, well, maybe I'm getting ready to be a millionaire. I believe that. So you make out your checks to the church. How do you want us to do this? MHM? MHM? Okay, make out your checks to MHM. And while you're doing that, you know, I'll tell you how to spell thousand. T-H-O-U-S-A-N-D. You say, well, how do I know this goes there? You can go with me. You can go with me. I'd love to have you go with me. I pray with you every morning. You know, we minister together. You lay hands on people with me. I'm not taking you to Pakistan or Iran. Don't get nervous. 
But China, you know, Brazil, those are wonderful countries. And we don't put you in a shabby hotel, we put you in a nice hotel. So you have lots of security and excellent food and you diet when you come home. But we rebuke the calories, so it's a little better. All right, we're going to have worship while you sow your seed. And hold it up. Hold up your seed. Say, this is Jehovah Jireh's seed. He is providing in unusual ways. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay. The splendor of the King Clothed in majesty Let all the earth rejoice All the earth rejoice He wraps himself Bob, I want to give you a scripture, uh, Luke 21, 15, that he's giving you a mouth and wisdom that the enemy cannot gainsay nor resist. You will speak the right things into the situation. The enemy will take away the blockade, and God will take you through by the words you are speaking into the circumstance. Luke 21, 15. Praise the Lord. Now, I want to just share with you the first step I ever made, big spiritual step, uh, I was 16, raised a liberal Methodist, went to a youth camp, Methodist youth camp, where a Baptist minister spoke and said, you could have Jesus in your heart. Well, I knew about Jesus, but I didn't know you could have him inside. So he shared with us how you could repent of your sins, invite Jesus to come into your heart. And I prayed the sinner's prayer at 16. I am 81, almost 82. The prayer is still working. That's the greatest prayer of all. When you pray and receive Jesus into your heart. How many of you have done that? Are you sorry? I don't think so. I know so. Now, how many of you would say tonight, well, I don't, yeah, I prayed the prayer, but my life is kind of funny. Not in sync with God. I wouldn't say I'm really serving God. How many of you here tonight would say, uh, I'm not where I should be with God? Would you put your hand up real high? Because I get the privilege of praying for you. I'm so proud of you. That's so good. Now, I want all of you just to stand up. You want to get right with God? No, not all of you. Just the ones who, I'm sorry. <laughs> just the ones who raised your hand. That's wonderful. Just stand right there. That's wonderful. Now, maybe you're here tonight and you say, oh, Meryl and I have prayed that prayer. You know, and I have Jesus in my heart, but I need the power. When I was 23, actually, my husband wouldn't marry me until I got spirit-filled. Because he said to me, Marilyn, I serve the devil with all my heart. I'm going to serve God with all my heart. And I'm not marrying a woman who's half-hearted. <laughs> and so I got spirit-filled. But it was worth it. <laughs> Amen. Amen. Maybe you've never experienced this wonderful power of God. Oh, and this wonderful prayer language. We don't know how to pray for things as we ought, 
but the Spirit prays through us, searches our hearts, knows the will of God, makes all things work together for good, praying in the Spirit. How many of you have never had a prayer language? Put your hand up really high. Now, if you're seated and you have your hand up, I'd like you to stand up. Just stand up. That's, I'm so proud of you. That is so wonderful. That is so wonderful. Now, I want everyone standing, come right up here to the front. We're going to clap for you, cheer for you, whistle for you. We are so happy. This is wonderful. 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 Clap some more. Hey, this is your fruit. This is what you pray for. This is what you believe God for. This is excellent. Excellent. Now, everyone seated, I need your help too. So extend your hand. Be my team tonight. Extend your hand, and I'm going to pray with you. You're going to pray out loud. April the 7th is the best day of your life. Then they're going to take you and pray with you individually. And I would say to you, don't leave the property till you pray in tongues. Amen? So everyone out there, pray the same prayer. Extend your hand. Say, Father, you love me just like I am. You have a wonderful plan for my life. You have a divine destiny for me. Forgive me of all my sins. Jesus, I believe you shed your blood. You died for my sins, and you arose from the dead. I invite you to come into my heart and be Lord of my life. Thank you for saving me. That's what the Bible says. You will never leave me. You'll never forsake me. Fill me with the Spirit. Use my life for your glory. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, I want all of you standing, not, not the helpers, but all of you who came forward, turn around and look at the people. Now, I want all of you out there, extend your hand, say, I'm praying for you. You made a wise decision. Now turn back around. How could you lose with that crowd praying for you? Amen? And so this, is, this church is a family, and they'll pray for you, stand with you until you can't believe it is out of this world. So who is leading these people to pray with them? Over here. See this wonderful pastor over here? Would you go this way? Clap for them as they go this way. And I will be available back at the book and tape table to sign your syllabus, your study guide. I'm not in a hurry. Clap some more. Clap some more. That's so good. So good. Bless you. Okay, stand up. I just love you all. It's such a privilege to come to the South. There's something so special an anointing on the south. You say you say it every place. I don't say it any place, but here. Now turn around and look at me. You won't be dizzy. You'll be okay. Turn around and look at me. Say, I believe, I believe. this Jesus encounter Jesus. is a turnaround in my life. Turn my life. Amen. Amen. Pastor Bob, is there something more you would like to say? Be here tomorrow night at what time? Seven. Okay. And I will be back there to sign your syllabus. You say, well, I want you to lay hands on me. I do that tomorrow night. Okay. So hug someone and I'll see you back there.
just at the middle. 